Welcome back. Okay, we're talking about Koopman operator theory and how we can use data and this Koopman operator to start uh, finding these uh, representations, these coordinate systems where strongly nonlinear systems start to look linear. Okay, so we want to find eigenfunctions of the Koopman operator that transform my system into these good measurements where the dynamics look linear. And then we can hopefully use those uh, embeddings for linear estimation, prediction, control, and analysis. We have great tools for linear systems. Finding those coordinate transformations is the hard part. Okay, so this is part of this series on Koopman analysis, past, present, and future. We're going to go into depth on the Koopman analysis. Uh, we've, we've been talking about how Koopman can essentially find representations of nonlinear systems from data, and we're going to dig in now to this, this challenge of representations. Okay, so uh, at the heart, what modern data-driven Koopman theory is doing is we're using data and regression techniques, kind of uh, techniques in machine learning and data science, to find these coordinate transformations, these special measurements of my system, where the dynamics look linear in those measurements. And this is very expensive and very challenging, but if I do it once, once I learn these coordinate transformations, everything afterwards becomes much simpler. Okay, so this is almost like an offline computation where it doesn't matter how hard it is to find these representations. Once I've found the representations, I've done all of the hard work, and then everything becomes easy for control and estimation and prediction after that. But finding these representations is still very challenging. And I want to point to a really important paper, kind of one of the seminal papers in moving Koopman theory forward is this extended dynamic mode decomposition um, by Matt Williams, Giannis Keverkidis, and Clancy Rowley. So there was this, this realization. So I, th I told you in the last time, dynamic mode decomposition has been very useful for approximating the Koopman mode decomposition for periodic and quasi-periodic systems. Okay, Very useful. It's kind of this workhorse linear algebra data-driven method for approximating Koopman, and it works great for periodic and quasi-periodic systems. Uh, but we've kind of known for a while that if you have strong transients or strong nonlinearities, intermittent phenomena, regular DMD, there's no linear model that can possibly give, my, give me multiple fixed points or um, you know, these, these transient behaviors. And so what these what this paper does is essentially generalize the idea of dynamic mode decomposition. So instead of building a regression model, the best fit linear operator from the state x at one time to the next time, what they do is they augment that state vector with a bunch of nonlinear measurements. So instead of just x, maybe x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth, and so on, maybe cosine of x, maybe radial basis functions or Bessel functions. So they take their already big state and they make it much, much bigger. And then they find a best fit linear operator that advances that entire augmented state forward. And that gets much closer sometimes to approximating the Koopman operator because the Koopman operator really is in this infinite dimensional Hilbert space. So they're moving towards approximating this Hilbert space with more measurement functions than just linear measurements of the state itself. Very important idea. It's set up a lot of what people are doing now on data-driven Koopman is really kind of based in the spirit of extended DMD. And they showed uh, this really nice example of it applied to a duffing system here. Um, you know, here's kind of this, this duffing oscillator uh, with two potential wells, and they identified these eigenfunctions using this data-driven method. So DMD would have failed miserably here. Extended DMD with enough data and enough training uh, can potentially fix this. Now, there are some issues. When I build a huge state vector of augmented states, like nonlinear measurements of my states, we possibly run into issues of overfitting. So if I try to find a best fit linear operator that advances a trillion nonlinear measurements forward, I have a trillion by trillion matrix. There's a lot of free parameters, and I can get into massive overfitting problems if I'm not very careful to cross-validate um, to cross-validate my, my results against test data that wasn't used in the training. And um, there's also related work um, by Frank Noe and collaborators uh, on something called the VAC, the VAC, um, Variational Confirmation Dynamics. I'll hopefully have, a, have the acronym spelled out, spelled out later. The VAC, the VAC method, is very closely related, um, and it builds in this cross-validation to prevent overfitting.
Okay. Uh, so I'm going to talk about essentially another way that we can prevent overfitting. This is work by Ulrike Kaiser. Uh, and this is a way that we can prevent overfitting by using sparsity in the regression. Okay, so this is, this is very much related to extended DMD. Uh, but what we're going to do is use sparse, pr sparsity promoting regression to find eigenfunctions directly. So what the, um, what the extended DMD method does is it essentially tries to find this gigantic A matrix that maps all of my nonlinear measurements forward in time. But when you look at the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of that huge matrix, oftentimes the eigenvectors and eigenvalues are spurious. If you, if you plot your data in those coordinates, they don't actually look linear, even though you get a linear regression model. And so what we thought was instead of trying to build this huge square matrix that has a bunch of eigenvalues and eigenvectors, why don't we just go for identifying the eigenfunctions directly, the relevant eigenfunctions directly from data, and let's use sparse regression to prevent overfitting. So we'll have less terms we're identifying, we'll need less data, and we'll get less overfitting. So we're going to use this PDE for Koopman eigenfunctions that we derived last time. And essentially what we're going to do is try to expand this eigenfunction phi in terms of this library of candidate functions theta. So each of these is a candidate function. This could be a Taylor series, this could be a Fourier series, it could be any you know, radial basis functions, whatever you like. We're going to try to expand our eigenfunction phi as a sum of these, these basis functions theta. And in particular, we're going to want this, these coefficients to be sparse. We want as few of these library elements as possible for my eigenfunction. So we, want, uh, we have a, a basis of possible candidate functions for the eigenfunction, but I only want to pick a few of them and add up a linear combination to approximate my eigenfunction. So this is related to the sparse identification of nonlinear dynamics. We're going to use the same sparse regression to find eigenfunctions. Um, <clears throat> you can, if you have trajectories of data, you can evaluate this on trajectories of data like this, so exit time one, exit time two, and so on. And you can also evaluate this kind of chain rule derivative term. I call this gamma x, x dot. You can evaluate this on data as well. And then once you have those two matrices, you can essentially solve for the sparsest vector c in the null space of this operator. And that will be a good approximation for these, the coefficients of these Koopman eigenfunctions. Now it turns out this is hard to do, um, and you have to kind of know lambda ahead of time. But what we found time and time again is that if you have eigenfunctions with, that are lightly damped, meaning that the, the real part of this is small, uh, nearly zero, these lightly damped eigenfunctions persist in the data for a long time. Those are the easiest to pull out with this regression. And fortunately, those are the ones that actually matter the most for prediction, estimation, and control. Because these lightly damped systems are the ones that are going to stick around the longest, and those are the ones you're going to have to control. So for example, total energy, like a conserved quantity like energy or angular momentum, is going to be one of these Koopman eigenfunctions with lambda zero. And Uruk has been able to find lots of those conserved quantities from data using this sparse framework, and then you develop control laws for that. Okay, so this is related to uh, in discrete time. If you write this in the discrete time formalism, you essentially recover the vac or the extended DMD uh, so the VAC method of Noe and, and Nuski uh, in 2013, or the extended DMD method of Williams, Kevrakidis, and Rowley 2015, is basically kind of our, this sparse identification in, in discrete time. And so you can essentially get sparse VAC or sparse EDMD models as well, but we're really trying to identify eigenfunctions directly instead of these big linear operators. Okay. Uh, and this is a flowchart that Ulrike made that essentially illustrates the, the pipeline. So you have some unknown dynamical system, in this case the duffing oscillator, which is a Hamiltonian conserved system if you don't have damping. Uh, we collect a bunch of data and we build these matrices theta and gamma here. And you try to find the sparsest vector of coefficients that satisfies this equation, this, this generator function. And when you find that, you discover that there is a conserved quantity, a Koopman eigenfunction at lambda zero, that is corresponding to the actual Hamiltonian of the system. So that's kind of cool. You can discover things like conserved quantities from the data, which happen to be Koopman eigenfunctions. And you can also discover more general lightly damped eigenfunctions, just using this kind of sparse identification of eigenfunctions. Okay. And again, it's based on the sparse regression down here. 
OK, so I want to uh, also point out you can use uh, deep neural networks to represent these eigenfunctions. So this is work by Bethany Lush, uh, Nathan Kutz, and myself. Uh, you can read about it on the archive. We're not the only ones by any means. There are a lot of groups working on using neural networks to find Koopman eigenfunctions. And uh, essentially what, what many of us, what many of these different approaches are doing is taking this basic autoencoder network structure where you try to find some, uh, some intrinsic or latent variable coordinates that parameterize your dynamics. And then you essentially enforce that in those coordinates you need to be advancing forward in time with a linear dynamical system. So it's basically an autoencoder network with a little bit more constraint so that what you get out of this trained autoencoder are eigenfunctions phi and the inverse of those eigenfunctions that map you back to the real state space. Uh, so really interesting work. We'll talk about this more with continuous spectrum systems. Um, but remember, what we're talking about is how challenging it is to find representations of eigenfunctions. We're trying to find eigenfunctions. We're trying to represent them in some basis. That's what EDMD does. That's what uh, the sparse eigenfunctions does. Increasingly, when I say I have a problem that's hard to represent and I have a lot of data, you should be thinking neural networks. Neural networks are amazing at representing complex functions if you have a lot of data. So this is only going to increase in usefulness in the future with more data and more powerful networks. We're going to be discovering these eigenfunctions using neural networks. Okay, and here is some related work. Lots of great work out there. Um, I mean, this isn't complete. So every couple of months, new papers come out on using deep learning for Koopman. So it's a really rapid field, very exciting. I think lots of, of people have independently recognized that we have a hard representation problem, and that's exactly what neural networks are good for. OK, so the last picture I want to draw is really how we think about this representation problem of Koopman eigenfunctions with error and complexity. OK, so what we want is a good model of a Koopman eigenfunction, and we want the lowest complexity possible that has good error. So the, the analytic Koopman operator theory lives kind of way over here in the right, where it's an infinite dimensional representation. I have these arbitrarily complex eigenfunctions, but they're perfect at linearizing my dynamical system. So this is kind of your unicorn Koopman eigenfunction out here. It theoretically exists, but we have a very hard time approximating and representing it with data and, and computers. OK, so we want to move over here and be in this lower left corner of complexity and error. The DMD, now if I have a periodic system, the error will be very good, but the generalizability might not be. But if I have kind of a transient, intermittent, or chaotic system, it's very low complexity. It's an actual linear model, uh, but it has pretty high generalizability error, uh, especially for chaotic and transient systems. And so the worst case scenario would be if there's just a line of models from DMD to Koopman where I don't really get any beneficial trade-off as I add complexity. I get a little bit better error. Um, what we in fact hope is that the curve looks more like this so that there's some sweet spot here where we get a pretty good model and also very low complexity. So this is kind of a trade-off, a compromise, where it's not perfect error, but it's also much less complex to represent than the full-blown Koopman. So we want to find models that live here. Now increasingly, we're using things like EDMD, this extended DMD, or neural networks to try to represent these, these kind of very complicated Koopman eigenfunctions. And I want to make an extremely important point. If you just measure error based on your training data, I can get an arbitrarily good neural network or EDMD model that matches the error on my training set. I can get like perfect error. But if I cross-validate, so if I hold out some of my, my data, if I, try, if I have some, some new trajectories that I didn't use to train, those are my test data, and I then validate those neural network models or cross-validate those neural network models or EDMD models, I might actually find that I have terrible error on the cross-validation because I overfit. And this is extremely important. You have to be aware of cross-validated error the fact that you can massively overfit these models because you have so many free parameters, you can perfectly fit your data, you have to cross-validate. You will get garbage models if you don't cross-validate. Uh, and so what you have to do is cross-validate your models. And if you do that, you can find these great, great models, these VAC, EDMD, this sparse identification, or deep learning models 
that have this kind of optimal trade-off of complexity versus error, what's known as parsimony, but you have to cross-validate your models. Okay, so all of these methods are very valid if you cross-validate. So the sparse chronic method builds in a sparsity promoting regularizer, so it's kind of parsimonious by construction. It penalizes the number of terms. Your deep Koopman and EDMD and VAC have to have this cross-validated error metric to, for, for model selection. And one of the things I really like about the VAC method, the VAC method, is that it actually, there's a, a VAC score that essentially is this cross-validated error score for your model. And so you can use this to select the most parsimonious models. So I think that's really useful. Um, but this is where we're trying to go. We're trying to find these, these low complexity or medium complexity representations with good error that embed my nonlinear dynamics in a linear framework. Okay, we'll talk more about what we can do with these for control and for kind of nasty, chaotic, intermittent systems later. Thank you.